Good morning. How are you? Are you happy? Are you well? Perhaps uh, some of us are unwell physically, emotionally. But the truth is that Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now this is important. As far as Jesus is concerned, he is not coming here on earth to make us merely have a life, giving us a bare existence, but to give us something which are needful. Needful to make our life imminently blessed and happy. That is why I ask you, are you happy? In other words, what Jesus is saying here is that He is not just keeping us merely from destructions or merely keeping us from hell, but giving us also eternal joy and peace in the place of the blessed prepared for us in the world of glory. Now, so if you believe, or if we believe in Jesus, our perspective of life will change and be able to rejoice now, now, and eternally. Do you understand this? But you may say, preacher, there are so many problems in my life, one after another. How can I rejoice now? Don't talk about eternally. But what I'm going to say to you today, this morning, is yes, you can. It may be unwell. You may be unwell. But your soul can be well. Last Sunday, sermon entitled, what is the title of last Sunday's sermon? You can see Hong preached to us, right? Between the devil and the deep blue sea. And we heard that the brothers of Joseph returned from Egypt without Simeon and told their father Jacob that the Lord of Egypt said that they must bring Benjamin to him if they want to buy food again. Jacob never expected a simple task of purchasing food can lead to a deeper crisis. We also learn that God is still working on Jacob. You see, to rescue Simeon is important, but to take Benjamin away from him is like taking away his life. So just like the many crises in our life, for example, Loss of loved ones, loss of job, loss our health, and facing death, etc. How can we live victoriously? That is the question we may want to ask. Even when our livelihood is threatened. So what are we missing in all this? This morning, let us learn some precious lesson from the family of Jacob in Genesis 43. Let us pray. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we, as we open your word, Lord, we pray that you open our hearts and mind, open our spiritual eyes to see, see your truth, receive your truth, that may help to nourish our soul and to heal and to help even those areas that are unwell in our, in our life. 
and make it well. Lord, help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So keep uh, Genesis 43 open. As you can see, that this chapter tells us that while Simeon remains in prison, Jacob struggled between the devil and the deep blue sea until the food is fast running out. So as Deacon Chi Hong put it last Sunday, Jacob feel like everything is against him. Joseph is dead. Simeon is gone. And now, they want Benjamin. Now it is like a losing battle. Moreover, we know the situation with Jacob and his children. None of his sons can be trusted. So how can he give up his favorite Benjamin? So the big issue here is that Jacob must decide quickly whether to let Judah bring Benjamin to Joseph as a proof of sincerity and honesty in order to purchase food and secure the release of Simeon or the whole family will face starvation and even death. So when Judah rise to the occasion and guarantee Benjamin's safety with his life, he offered that if there were to be any mishap happen to Benjamin, he is willing to be cursed forever. Hey, that is a very serious thing in those days to say that. So we see Jacob relented. But still, Jacob cannot be sure, you see, whether Joseph will eventually be pleased to sell them the food, to release Simeon, and to allow the safe return of all his sons. The truth is that this is a severe famine. As the Bible tells us, it is, it is the whole family, not just three sons at stake. And God has in His mercy, as we see here, has provided the hope of survival in Joseph. So now Jacob must wrestle with God once again. As we were reminded last Sunday, Joseph has to wrestle with God once again and ask for a blessing or he died. Still, the big question is this. At the end, will Joseph be pleased when Benjamin is brought to him? Nobody knows. So what should Jacob do? This is what the Bible tells us. First, Jacob finally let Benjamin go to go with his brothers to Egypt. The implication here is that Jacob now has nothing left for the safety in his old age. And he instructs Judah to return the money. He said maybe mistakenly somebody has made a mistake and placed the money in the sacks. And this shows his honesty. He's not going to keep the money or keep quiet about it. And thirdly, he prepared a present. Cannot imagine that. That he had to prepare a present for Joseph. Even in times of famine, he will squeeze out something. Again, again, these precious items that mentioned here during this difficult time is really also a reflection of Jacob's respectful attitude towards Joseph, towards the king or the lord of the land in Egypt, knowing that Joseph has the power to do whatever he wish. And finally, and significantly, in verse 14, he tells us, 
that Jacob turned to God. Jacob prayed for God's mercy. Jacob shows at this moment that he is completely dependent on God. He said, may God, after all this preparation, he said, may God Almighty, not just God, but God Almighty, grant you, referring to Judah, mercy before the men. And may he send back your other brother, Simeon, and of course, Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved, listen carefully, I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. We observe here, Jacob has given up all his children, not just Benjamin. Standing alone, depending on God's mercy. He has come to reckon that it is God, it is God who has the control over human's heart and all circumstances. Jacob recognizes, although some reluctantly, that it will be God's mercy that makes possible, listen carefully, the acceptance by Joseph, even if he is willing to let go of Benjamin and trust Judah. Jacob is in a situation of all or nothing. If I believe, I believe. If I perish, I perish. For better or for worse, whatever the outcome, Jacob must accept. That is what verse 14 tells us. So at this point, we see a very significant change in Jacob's life. Jacob's heart is turned from Benjamin to focus on God's mercy. So the implication is a paradox. I spoke to you about the paradox of God. So here is another one. Our weakness and vulnerability become strength and safety when we trust in God's mercy, when we depend on God's mercy, just like Jacob. It is now the mercy of God, not Benjamin. It's the real strength and safety for Jacob. As we also see in Paul's life, the great apostle Paul, when he suffers a thorn in his, in his flesh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 to 10, he said three times, I pleaded with the Lord about this, about the thorn in the flesh, that it should leave us, it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, therefore, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Why? For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul must humbly admit that he is weak and embrace the grace of God. Depend on the grace of God. Then he will be strong. Clinging on what we have on earth, for example, people or idols, it will deny us the power of God. It will deny us the working of God in our life. There was a man named Horatio Spafford. He invested heavily in the real estate on the shore of Lake Michigan. But they were wiped out, wiped out by fire in Chicago fire in 1871. In 1873, he sent his wife, Anna, and four daughters back to England on a ship while he stays back 
for a few more days to finish up some business matter before he joined them again. Unfortunately, the ship his wife and daughters were in collided with another vessel in Atlantic Ocean and sunk. 226 passengers lost their life, including their four daughters. Several days later, he received a message from his wife, a telegram. He says, Save alone. What shall I do? When Spafford left on a ship to join his heartbroken wife, while passing the spot where his four daughters died, he pens this famous hymn, It is well with my soul. How his soul can be well in sorrow. Let's take a look at the lyrics. Notice that in first stanza, he expresses his deep sorrow. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea below flow, whatever my Lord, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And then the second stanza, second and third stanza, he focuses on the redemption of Christ. Though Satan should baffle, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh! The bliss of this glorious talk. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And finally, in stanza, the fourth stanza, he turns, he turns to the glorious second coming of the Savior. And Lord, praise the day. When the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so, it is well with my soul. In such personal tragedy and sorrow, and still he is able to say, it is well with my soul. This is not natural. Spafford not only lost his properties, but he also lost his precious young children. This is not positive thinking, my dear. This is not counselling. This is not man's work, but God. This is supernatural at work to bring comfort. Even crisis in deep blue sea can be lifted by the hope of God's mercy. Spafford recovered and fulfilled his lifelong interests. In 1881, he established the American colony at Jerusalem with a group of his friends to care for the sick and the destitute. So let me ask you this morning, what are you struggling with right now? Look to Jesus and say a prayer and ask Him to show you His mercy. When Joseph's brothers were ushered into the palace, they were so afraid that they will face ill treatment. Specifically, they think that they may be locked up. They may be put to slavery for not paying for the food they purchased in, the, in their last trip 
or maybe they have been, they'll be accused of stealing the money but they were wrong their fears of danger was unfounded because in God's mercy full payment has been made look at uh, verse 23 the stewards declares peace to you do not be afraid now listen carefully your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you I received your money now where did this Egyptian get to know God Jehovah and from whom from whom he received the money from Joseph of course by working with Joseph this man sees God's mercy working through Joseph to save Egypt to save all the Egyptians from starvation and now he is seeing that through Joseph God is saving his own family for Joseph's brothers it is real peace when they are declared not guilty because the Lord of the land has no charge against them Zero. All paid. For Joseph's brothers, it is real peace. Not only that they are not guilty, but also when they are told that the money in the sacks were put there for them by their God. What a wonderful declaration is made here. And this is really a, also a powerful reminder for us of what Jesus did on the cross for us 2,000 years ago as our great high priest who presented himself as a sinless offering for the full payment of our sins and opened the way for us, for us to be accepted in heaven. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 4, 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is every, in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Look at verse 16. This is the conclusion. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Therefore, running to God is not a weakness but strength because we are running to the one who not only knows what we are going through but he will, he will sympathize with us and give us what we need and more. He paid for us. Yes, we are free. But He provides even more for us to live with. So the implication is this. In God's mercy, as shown to us in the life and the work of Jesus Christ, peace, is a reality I say peace is a reality not a fantasy God's mercy is constantly available for the believers to find release of tensions of guilt and sin in our heart in our minds in our life this precious truth bring instant relief to the believer who needed comfort and strength even when the truth is expressed in a song. I know of the song Amazing Grace when it is uh, sung by someone else or sung by herself, by oneself. He can draw 
the tear of joy. I'm talking about my, one of my sisters in law. Because during my mother's in law's funeral, I think you know that my mother in law was safe. And that was a Christian funeral. This song, Amazing Grace, ministered to her powerfully. So whenever she heard the song or sing the song, she cried. Every month, I minister Holy Communion to Mr. Ong, the father of Priscilla and Shige and Shi Hong. After he's been baptized, I will sing with him his favorite song, Kan Go Ai Chiu. He cried. Coming to the last part, he will cry. 39 years ago, we lost our seven month old son through accident. When I received the call, I rushed back from camp to the hospital. And all I can see is my seven-month-old son lying there cold. My wife and I were inconsolable. My pastor and my elder were there, but they were speechless. And you know what? As I look at my son, I sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. It, it, it just came. It, it just came and then I just sing. What a friend I have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. What peace we often forfeit. What needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Mibu and I recovered. And soon after, God gave us two more daughters. The truth is that when we are inconsolable, God can. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Jesus offers a special peace that cannot be found on earth, cannot come from men, cannot come from anything. A peace is from heaven through Jesus we know. So on the declarations of the steward, that he has received the payment. Bible tells us Simeon is released and the way is cleared for Joseph's brother to present the little present they brought to the Lord of the land. So in verse 26, when Joseph appeared, seeing his brothers bow down before him and present to him their little present, and hearing that his father Jacob is well, Joseph cannot take it anymore. The Bible tells us that Joseph go to another room to weep, to cry, because his whole family is intact. And he calls for a big celebration. Look at verse 31. Let's eat. 
Then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. The law of the land says, Serve the food. Notice that the joy of Joseph, listen carefully, the joy of Joseph in his crying and his giving the command to serve the food, to welcome his brother, is not, I repeat, is not derived from the gift or the little present that they brought. The present they brought to Joseph did not do the trick. It is not what they have in their hands, but what they have in their hearts that counts. The bowing and the gift are signs, listen carefully, of their sincere seeking for mercy at this point of time. This is what really pleases Joseph. It reminds us of the truth that God desires our hearts, not our possessions, not our sacrifice. Notice that they are sitting in the palace, feasting with Joseph, the Lord of the land. Privilege of being Joseph's brothers and eating from his table, the Bible tells us. Picture, picture the Holy Communion that we partake every month. Notice also that there is no more envy or jealousy when Joseph, in verse 34, the last verse that tells us, Joseph gave Benjamin more, much more, not just more, much more honor than other brothers. Portions were taken from them, to them from Joseph's table. Privilege. But Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of them or of theirs. And they drank and were married with Joseph. So the implication is this. When our hearts seek only God's mercy, listen carefully, we are at peace not only with God, but also with men. So the conclusion for Genesis 43 is this. This chapter really tells us that actually Jacob's family has nothing to worry about. Isn't that true? Even in between the devil and the deep blue sea. Because there is God's mercy already there for them. From start to the end. As far as Joseph is concerned. Of course Jacob didn't know. Until now. Even they have even they have messed up their life and facing severe famine. Sound like the punishment, isn't it? All they need to do is to bring Benjamin to see Joseph. And when they do, they receive not only food they needed, but also the release of Simeon. And not only that, also the feasting in the palace. Now this reality of God's mercy working actively for God's people is also told to us. Don't miss that. It was told to us by the great Apostle Paul. In the responsive reading. But God, verse number 4, But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Look at verse 6. And raised us up with Jesus and seated us with Jesus in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in spite of all our failures, in His mercy, God raised us with Christ, seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Past 10. Done. Picture yourself sitting with Christ like Joseph's brother sitting in the palace with the Lord of the land, feasting in times of famine. So the truth for life is this. In God's mercy, we have victory over crisis. We should face crisis from the position of victory, position of strength, not position of defeat and weakness because we have been raised 
I repeat, because we have been raised to the privileged position, not with some powerful people, but with Jesus who loved us and died for us and said to us, I came so that you may have life and have it abundantly. In application, let us learn to do three R's. First, rejoice in God's mercy. Let the wonderful scriptural truth, God's truth, fill your hearts. Make God's mercy your daily memory so that you may find strength to deal with all difficulties or crises. For example, losing health, losing wealth, losing job. Don't forget God. In times of life crisis, boldly look to God and let Him minister to your sorrow that no one can. Take time out to process. May it be alone or with someone that you can trust. Go for a walk. Talk to people. Or go for a retreat. Until the truth of God's mercy set you free. And the next second R is to reflect. Reflect in your life a sincere attitude towards God. Like Jacob did. Let go of idols. As he let go Benjamin. To depend on God's mercy. Present precious possession to God. Be sincere. Don't let possession to possess you. And finally, the last hour is to rally, rally others to receive God's mercy. What I mean is that be a minister of God's mercy. Especially in time of crisis. You see, we can't take away their pains. We cannot change the situation, but we can pray. We can pray for the merciful intervention of God, the Spirit. Praying ministry, indeed, is much needed. Let us pray. As I read to you, from Ephesians chapter 2. Let God's truth fill your hearts. Let God's truth fill your mind. And I ask you to picture yourself as Joseph's brother in the palace. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walk, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, make us alive together with Christ. By grace, you are saved, you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank You. Thank You, Lord, for this powerful and clear reminder of the positions that You have placed us even right now. There have been times, Lord, that we 
encounter life difficulty, we totally forgotten about this truth that you have placed it, Lord, in your holy word. Cause us, O Lord, to remember how much you love us, how much you have done for us. And Lord, that in times of need, you have mercy upon us. Cause us to place all our trust in you. Cause us to look to you for mercy when there is no mercy. Cause us, O Lord, to be well when things are not well. Thank you, O Lord. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now offer